Listening to Democracy Watch, the News Collective's weekly hour long news report, bringing you alternative and undercovered current affairs from around Vancouver and the Lower Mainland. I'm Alex DeBoer. And I'm Andy Laidman. And I'm Adeline Ping. It's Thursday, July 19th at 5 03 p.m. We're broadcasting from UBC's Vancouver campus on the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territories of the Hunkaminam speaking Musqueam people. Today on Democracy Watch, we will hear the second part of our series on SESTA FOSTA, the American bills that made websites responsible if third parties were found to be posting illegal ads for prostitution. The bills have had far-reaching implications for sex workers, including those here in Vancouver and the Lower Mainland. The piece will feature local sex worker and activist Carmen, who tells us her story and the real-world impacts the bills have had on her. Following that, we will hear a piece on the recent fires at the Topanga Cafe, a Mexican restaurant in Kitts on West 4th Avenue at Bayswater Street. Topanga Cafe caught fire on July 5th and then again on July 11th. In today's piece, we will learn how the restaurant's destruction has affected the neighborhood. And for the final section of our show, we have a live interview with One City Council candidates, Brandon Yan and Christine Boyle. Brandon will be joining us live in the studio and Christine will be joining us by phone. We'll be chatting with both of them about their party and also online harassment. So let's get started. We're going to begin with uh, Warning Back Pages Not Found. This is part two of a three part series by Andy Laidman and Sammy Smart. Enjoy. <laughs> On April 11, 2018, the United States passed the Stop Enabling Sex Traffickers Act and allow states to fight online sex trafficking act into law. The two bills grouped together and referred to as SESTA-FOSTA are framed as a way to prevent online sex trafficking, but in reality are causing many problems for sex workers in the United States and internationally as U.S.-based websites like Backpage were seized under the new law. My name is Sammy Smart, and together with Andy Laidman, we conducted a series of interviews investigating the real-world effect of the legislation on Vancouver sex workers. To get an idea of how SESTA-FOSTA affects people's real life here in Canada, I interviewed Carmen, a local sex worker and activist, to get her take on the closure of the Backpages website. I'm in the sex industry, and I do a few different things. I do sensual massage, I do um, authentic tantra coaching, and I work as an escort courtesan. And I've done a bit of erotic film as well. Most of your work done through an agency or is it mostly freelance? It's um, all independent at this point. When I started out, maybe the first couple of years of my career, I was working through agencies. But I like being my own boss, and I like being able to control who I see, how I work, when I work. I do mostly in-call, and out-call I, I often can walk, or just or my partner drives me. Was there anything specifically that triggered your switch to independent, or was it more keeping the money to yourself and you're setting your own schedule? Mm -hmm. It was a combination. I, I worked for an agency for about a year and a half, and 
they were not that concerned about our safety and they put quite a few of the girls, myself included, in bad situations. And then because of the non-disclosure agreement that we signed, those that needed to go to the police and press charges were not able to do so. So what type of safety measures do you put in place for yourself now? If I'm arranging a meeting with someone and they're a new client, I'll check up on them, their LinkedIn. That's a little tricky to do with the laws in Canada because clients are criminalized, so they're not as um, eager to give their real name. Most of them understand and they'll give me that information. And then I always say where I'm going and leave the information with someone who will check up on me after when I say that I'm going to be done. And then I can either tell them I'm going to be there longer or come home. I'm, I'm in a secret group of sex workers and we have a bad date list that we we keep for for each other and warn each other about everyone from violent clients to time wasters. You know, we usually go by phone numbers, but now with texting apps, that's, and it's pretty easy to change your phone number. So again, it's, we're just piecing together these bits of information to try and be safer when we should just have, be empowered by be supported by the laws of our country to make our work as safe as possible. And of course, if you're using mostly cell phone numbers and things that puts Mm -hmm. street workers at an incredible disadvantage and the Mm -hmm. fact they don't have access to that type of information. Exactly. I mean, there are the bad date reports that Pace and Wish circulate. They're sometimes incomplete license plate numbers, descriptions. The, um, the workers that work outside or who work on, in maybe the downtown east side, the workers who don't have access to as much money, they're the ones who are getting affected primarily. I know you mentioned that most clients are pretty understanding. Have you found that that takes quite a bit to get that out there? Or is it something that's quite, playing the situation to clients, do they tend to be like, okay, I understand. Here's my mm-hmm. real name. Here's some facts about me. Or is it quite a bit harder and you've run into situations where that hasn't been the case? Some clients are really paranoid about giving their real identity. But I, I've been in the media a lot. I have a pretty high profile as a sex workers' rights activist. So often they'll say, I, I wouldn't normally, but I trust you because I know you're not a cop because you've been all over the news. Leo List is a Vancouver-based advertising platform similar to Backpages.com that many workers in our city use together with American-based sites to advertise their services on. I asked Carmen about whether the platform was still a good alternative. Well, Leo List used to be way better for me. It used to, I'd put an ad up and I'd, I'd usually get a lot of same-day inquiries. But now it's just so saturated that I'll post an ad and then an hour later it's off page one and you have to bump it again, which costs more money for someone who's just starting out. That would be awful to try and compete with all these people in one one place. There's this new one, um, Yes Backpage, and I don't know if they're actually legit or if it's trick by someone trying to get our information. <laughs> There's maybe one ad on there. It's kind of creepy. You know, shut down our, our platforms and limit our choices that leaves us way more vulnerable to be taken advantage of by scammers and bad clients and abusers. And yeah, so they're having the opposite effect of what the law is supposed to do. I've actually found some really good clients on Twitter, wonderful repeat clients from from Twitter, and some of the ones that I connect with the most that are really lovely people. So it's it's great and it's free. Well, I, I'm always saying that New Zealand has the only system in the world that makes sense for sex workers because they do complete decriminalization. And the, the only thing, the only complaint I have is that they don't let people come into the country to do sex work. So that was my plan when the laws changed here it was like, I'm out of here. But they um, they have decriminalization and... There was a case a while ago of a a woman who was being harassed by her manager at a brothel and she took him to court for sexual harassment and she won. 
And that's something that I couldn't see happening anywhere else in the world right now. And we need that kind of workplace rights and safety everywhere. I mean, Amnesty International calls for global decriminalization of the sex industry between consenting adults. And I, I support that position. I, I think that's the only, the only way to do it that's respectful for people who actually do the work. Landlords can potentially be charged if they rent to us. So we have to be really careful and under the radar. Like I, I've lost housing in the past for being a sex worker. And you no, know, that's a violation of human rights. That shouldn't happen, but it happens all the time. And it's always the people who have never worked in the industry who are making the decisions. And it's it's like I'm not an, an authority on how to keep coal miners safe. So nobody's asking me that. But they're asking people who have no idea what happens in the sex industry how it should be regulated. Yeah, a lot of women are struggling in, in the industry now with Backpage and Craigslist being down. I volunteer at Pace Society every week. and. I've had ladies calling in saying, where are we supposed to advertise now? I used to get all my business on Backpage. Now it's gone. What am I supposed to do? And there are other places to advertise, but they're so oversaturated now that it has affected all of us and our, our income. As always, it's the ones that are less privileged that suffer the most. So it's all those things affect how we can work and you know race and sexuality all enter in there's a lot of stuff that workers of color have to deal with that I don't there's a lot of layers to you know how this these laws affect different people when craigslist's erotic services section opened um female homicide rates went down 17% so closing these platforms is going to make life a lot more dangerous for workers and it's something we all need to be concerned about. So what kind of activities would you like to see allies engaging in? Well I think I, I'd like to see people writing letters to the Justice Minister Jody Wilson-Raybould and the Prime Minister about decriminalization. They did suggest before they got elected they would work to decriminalize the industry. And I've gone and spoken at roundtables with the government, and they're basically doing nothing. They, they say it's not a priority. Write letters, sign petitions, come out and march with us, please. <laughs> Warning, back page not found, featuring local sex worker and activist Carmen. On behalf of myself and Sammy Smart, I'd like to thank you for tuning into our segment here on CITR. There is one more segment to come, so if you're interested in learning more about what types of reform sex workers are calling on Canada to implement, as well as hearing another personal story, you can catch the next segment in two weeks' time. This is a rebroadcast of Democracy Watch from July 19th. This episode has been edited slightly for timeliness. Hear live broadcasts of Democracy Watch every Thursday at 5 p.m. on CITR 101.9 FM or stream live at citr.ca. You can also find the News Collective on Twitter and Facebook under the name at CITR News. You forgot the surfboards? How are we going to shred the gnarly waves now? Well, I got just the replacement. I picked up some copies of Discorder instead. Well, it looks like this surf day just got a whole lot better. This extra special summer issue of Discorder features interviews with local punk rockers Lie, queer Métis fashion designer Evan Ducharme, and the hosts of CITR's Radio Pizza Party. There will also be an exclusive Bartholomew comic strip, short fiction by Mac Gordon, and a suggested summer reading list compiled by the staff of Massey Books. And of course there will be reviews of the Music Waste and Sled Island Music Festivals, as well as podcasts, films, and more. Thank you to our advertisers, Blueprint, Timber Concerts, The Cinematheque, Rickshaw Theatre, Mint Records, Hexistential Festival, Current Symposium, Audio Pile, and An Evening in Damascus.
You know what's better than reading a great magazine? Reading a great magazine that also helps you fight poverty. Megaphone Magazine is sold by homeless and low-income vendors on the streets of Vancouver and Victoria. Vendors buy magazines for 75 cents and sell them for $2. It's flexible, low-barrier work for people who may not have access to traditional jobs. Download the Megaphone app to find vendors and buy the magazine even when you don't have change. Welcome back, listeners. Uh, now we have an upcoming piece on the unfortunate fire that occurred at Topanga Cafe that was located at 2906 West 4th Avenue. Um, not only did it contain the Topanga Cafe, it actually had seven tenants upstairs, as well as the Royal Feet Clinic, a massage clinic. Um, here we go. Here's the piece. I mean, I remember Scarlett, who's now our middle daughter. She was, uh, she's now 27 years old. I remember her as basically a uh, one-year-old, and uh, we noticed that people were looking at us, and uh, we realized that she had held the plate. She was licking, holding the plate up to her face and licking the plate. She loved the food so much. So That was Graham Smith, a regular at Topanga Cafe since 1983, explaining just how delicious the Cali Mexican food was. To him... Topanga Cafe was one of the cornerstones to the Kitsilano community, a traditional meeting place on Friday evenings for him and his family, and a Vancouver institution untainted by the continuous development within our city. Well, I got the call at 5 in the morning from the alarm monitoring station that the fire bells were going off, so I live in Carysdale. I jumped in my car and was speeding down McDonald, and as soon as I got uh, down to King Edward, I can see the fire smoke rising, so I knew it was definitely a fire, so I was pretty panicked because uh, the tenants were long-term tenants, so I was calling them as I was driving to make sure they all got out. And the closer I got, the worse I can see it got. You know, more fire trucks, flames shooting up. Uh, the back of the building was completely engulfed in flame. Commenting on the morning the Topanga Cafe was ablaze, Terry Brickovitz property manager of the 2904 West 4th building also told me how lucky it was that no one was injured. Other members of the Kitsilano community, including Sandra Jones, also recalled the morning of the fire as she witnessed it firsthand across the street from her apartment. Uh, well, the first reaction when I heard the fire bell at 5 a.m. in the morning was, oh no, it's got to be fake. Uh, and then I looked at, out the window and I saw a glow in the sky. And uh, I decided I have an accounting career in White Rock, and I decided to stay home and just watch it and to see how far it was going to spread. So uh, it was terrible. It was sad. It was frightening. It looked like a big ball of evil in the sky. And, uh, yeah, there's a lot of history there. So, yeah, I used to eat there and, you know, run over my pajamas at night, grab a snack, and run back. So I live right across the street. Not only containing the Topanga Cafe, the 1912-era Heritage Building also housed long-term tenants as well as a massage clinic called Royal Feet. You know, 20 staff at uh, the restaurant are out of work. Um, there's 16-plus people out of work at the reflexology Royal Feet uh, massage. And, and then you got seven tenants without homes that lost everything they own. Also mentioning the significance of Topanga Cafe's identity as a local institution was Saib Donnelly, a barista at Artistry Coffee Shop which is located across the street from the Fallen Heritage Building. I think it is a big loss. Even across the street, if you look on the fences they've put up, people have put like messages and flowers and just on Monday they did a benefit concert to raise money for the people that live there. So people do seem really sad for it and I think like it's so important to keep those small businesses alive because like we work I work here it's small it's locally owned and um, I just think it's so important because everything now is just chains. Fortunately the Kitsilano community is strong and as Sive mentioned people from the neighborhood were brought together this past Monday July 16th in an effort to raise money for the tenants of the Topanga Cafe fire. Musician Richard Lowey also a Kitsilano resident, reached out to property manager Terry Berkowitz and asked if he could help out by using his performance at the Kitsilano showboat to spread awareness of the plight. Uniting people with classic rock music while requiring singing and dancing to be mandatory amongst the crowd, Lowy's fundraiser garnered a strong community presence of 500 people and raised $2,200. 
And so it was really about the awareness of what was going on to make sure that everybody knew, you know, what a great loss this was to the community and the building and then also the uh, tragedy that happened to these families that lived in these places that uh, now they've got nothing and they have to move out and all the employees at the Tavango Cafe. So these people are out of a job and, you know, some of them have been there for years. So it was really just kind of like a salute to all of them and say, you know, the community's here and we're, you know, we, we're going to miss you, the building. And so it was kind of a, a somber moment and a happy moment, you know, to celebrate life. Everybody got out okay. Nobody was injured. So that was good news. There's also a GoFundMe page for the tenants of the Topanga Cafe and a continuous Facebook feed of supportive words. But what remains to be indisputable are the lasting memories Topanga Cafe had on people. Just being there with the kids and uh, and meeting all the staff. There was a whole range of really interesting people, artists and and uh, writers and you know and musicians. One guy I even took music lessons from a guy that uh, used to work there guitar lessons. I mean, it's just an interesting crew. Mm. So it always felt like you're in kind of a quasi-bohemian atmosphere. Uh, it was very casual. It would be the same damn table and chair, at least old school chairs they had, yeah. these old tile tables year after year. So it's like being a, any, I don't know if you've ever been a regular in some place, but you feel like you're part of something, you're part of a community. It's not just a restaurant. You're going in to drop a bit of money and eat something. Mm. Uh, it had continuity. It wasn't right? that transactional, really. Yeah, it was like a being a, a friend, you know, it was like a community center. I remember, it must have been like 2006 or so, Paisley was working there, my eldest sister, and Scarlett was working there at the same shift. We were there for dinner, and it was like our whole family was somehow completely ingrained and involved in the restaurant. They were bringing us <laughs> <Yeah>. drinks. <laughs> it was hilarious. The BC government now covers medications that could reduce your chances of contracting HIV by 90%. PREP stands for Pre-Exposure Prophylaxis and is a preventative measure that HIV-negative folks can take to reduce their risk of becoming positive. Health Initiative for Men suggests that if you have had sex with a partner with HIV, have had a recent STI, have multiple sexual partners, have a history of inconsistent or no condom use, are currently involved in sex work, or have had repeated courses of post-exposure prophylaxis, then you might want to think about looking into PREP measures. CATR and Discorder are not medical professionals. Please refer to your doctor for more information. People are really done with politics as usual. But then it's all about the competition. Every Vancouverite has their own story. The perfect time for our alternative. Vancouver's municipal election looms October 20th. Do you know who's running for city council, school board, parks board? This is a wacky municipal election, and you're going to want to stay updated. Download Seeking Office, the newest municipal elections podcast from CITR's News Collective. Find Seeking Office on iTunes and Stitcher or wherever you download your podcasts starting July 3rd. Hello and welcome back to CITR 101.9 FM. Thanks for being with us today. As mentioned earlier, today's live interview will feature Christine Boyle and Brandon Yen, two candidates running for Vancouver City Council as part of the One City Party. The party's core values include building an inclusive, vibrant, and affordable city. They will focus on issues such as affordable housing, inclusive communities, neighborhood schools, and environmental and climate justice. First, we'll provide a bit of background on our guests. Christine is a Vancouver native who is a community organizer, climate justice activist, and church minister. She mentions in her platform that she would like to tackle Vancouver's growing wealth gap, increase democratic engagement, and contribute to climate solutions. Brandon is the Education Director for Out on Screen, a Vancouver-based arts organization that showcases the journeys of queer, trans, and two-spirit people through initiatives such as the Vancouver Queer Film Festival and Out in Schools, an education program that addresses homophobia, transphobia, and bullying through film and video. He is also a community advocate for sustainability, affordability, education, and human rights. 
So the focus of today's interview will be online engagement and navigating harassment and abuse while running for office, particularly with regard to social media. A couple of days ago on July 15th, Christine tweeted that, Dear feminist slash political woman folks, do you have any guidelines written down for when you block slash mute people on social media? And how do you handle trolls or abuse? I'm going on instinct, but I assume it will get worse closer to E-Day, and I'd love something firmer to lean on. Thank you. She got about a dozen replies to that tweet, some by local female politicians like sitting Vision City Councilor Andrea Reimer and Suzanne Antone, a former Attorney General, MLA, and City Councilor. In Reimer's reply, she recommended that Christine block or unfriend people making especially serious statements, those that would be defined under the Canadian Charter as hate speech. Reimer also says that she has respect for people who respond to online abuse. She says that, like bullying, sometimes you need to take a stand. So first off, Christine, could you tell us a bit about what prompted you to post that tweet this past Sunday? Sure. So like you said in the interview, and and thank you for having us on for this conversation, like you said in the intro, um, Brandon and I running with One City, our focus is really on affordability. It's on the housing crisis and the opioid crisis. Um, And I think it matters a lot um, how we run uh, and to run and to govern in a way that allows more women and unconventional candidates, like I think both of us are, to see themselves as having a place at the table. Um, and so I guess I want to start by saying that, that I haven't experienced much online harassment yet in this campaign, but I have certainly witnessed the level of vitriol targeted at friends and colleagues who are climate leaders, who do anti-racism work, and who are locally elected leaders. Um, and so I asked for advice online in order to sort of prepare myself for the level of um, harassment that I see online. And and I think it matters a lot because we want and we need diversity in leadership. And particularly at this time of crisis in Vancouver, we need courageous and compassionate leaders who are willing to tackle difficult issues. And um, and this the level of harassment uh, online certainly has uh, scared away folks that I have talked to and wish uh, would love to see run for office someday. Yeah, there's something about that um, that yet in your answer that's, that's kind of telling. It seems as though this level of um, abuse of these online platforms is almost something that as a public-facing figure you're resigned to in advance in, in 2018? I think so, and I've gotten many more um, private responses uh, online um, from my tweet as well. I mean, I, I wrestle with being resigned to it, um, obviously, and uh, and I want to be talking about um, these important issues that really uh, have both Brandon and I and um, the three school board candidates that One City is running all, all fired up to run. Um, so uh, I keep hoping the conversation sort of pivots to those issues. Um, but like I said, I do think that this reality is uh, important to tackle so that uh, in the long run we have more people willing to run for office. Um, I, I, I know uh, that Brandon and I can be tough enough to get through it, um, and I wish that that weren't the reality that people needed to face. Yeah, I think um, the fact that you addressed your tweet specifically to um, women and female-identified people in politics is significant as well. And we'd like to, I think, ask you about that um, as well. But Brandon, you're, Brandon, who's here with us in studio as well, um, also has a, I mean, a lot of direct experience grappling with this same issue of online abuse on social media, but in a different context. You've done a lot of work with sort of queer and trans youth organizations? Yeah, so without the, the work I do with Out in Schools and what we're seeing currently in British Columbia, at least, is a lot of pushback on even just accepting the fact that LGBTQ plus people exist and should be represented in every aspect of our society, um, mm-hmm. whether it's curriculum, um, whether it's in film and television, um, whether it's in politics. And so what I see in my work is typically uh, usually some well-funded organizations, and we're not sure where they get their money from, but um, they tend to roam around the province drumming up this kind of anti-LGBT support. 
um, under the guise of uh, protect the children and freedom of speech. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we're seeing that um, that we're seeing that municipalities and governments are actually stepping up to to stop them from holding these kinds of events and then um, being challenged with legal legal challenges as well. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm used to getting the occasional random hate mail. Um, and even it's, it's not even sometimes hateful, um, but it's kind of like death by a thousand cuts. Um, when you have someone who sends you an email saying, I don't want you, specifically like a person like you, um, in a school with my child um, talking about, quote unquote, your lifestyle. And I'm just like, you know, you kind of have to laugh at it for a second. It's like, like. It's not a lifestyle. Um, <laughs> tennis is a lifestyle. Like, you know, those kinds of things. And it's, it's, it, it does add up over time, I think, for folks, especially depending on your intersections yeah. of identity and how much that can contribute to your, your, your mental health status. So, yeah. And is this um, something that you've experienced to a greater degree since sort of stepping up as a political candidate? I mean, it sounds like it's a reality of of life full stop um <laughs> yeah. but how, how does being in the sort of open facing political role affect that uh in many ways it's, i mean it's, it's it's very complex because um the second you know you jump into a race like this i start questioning all my motives for everything i do um and where i show up in the world even with my work so my work is um focused on education and art and in that is inherently political uh, and me running for council is also political, and so the potentials for conflicts of interest are are a lot. And so for me, even just like, so if I show up to this event, am I council candidate Brandon Yan, or am I education director Brandon Yan, and where can those things be construed? Because my life is inherently political being a queer person of color um, and doing the work I do. And so it's like I'm just constantly thinking about how I'm being perceived, and it's mm. it's a lot to, to, to take in. Um, even things where I like would, would engage with things like in, in Chinatown is like, that's a space I care about, but now that I'm running for office, it's I, I feel like I might be taking up space in a way that could be construed as using an issue to my advantage. Yeah. And so navigating identity and politics um, is just something I just constantly am thinking about <laughs> over yeah. and over again, where I think I feel like sometimes people don't necessarily have that burden, um, especially as we look at the the lack of diversity in, in, in just governance in Metro Vancouver in general. Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, this kind of leads into something else that I'd like to to ask both of you guys about, um, which is as a sort of private citizen living my life in society, uh, if I face this kind of like online abuse from unknown individuals, my um, instant reaction to that would would pretty much be to block people um, and avoid that, which I think is entirely within my rights as a citizen. <laughs> how does it um how does it change that equation for you in thinking about those decisions when you are in a public facing role? Maybe Christine, do you want to tell us your feelings on that first? Yeah, I wrestle with that because I think that engagement, uh, citizen engagement, really matters, and that's the type of elected leader that I want to be, that I aspire to be, to be engaging with people who disagree with me as well as who agree with me and to be willing to take on um, difficult challenges like uh, Vancouver is facing. And so to figure out that line of what um, uh, of what reasonable engagement um, looks like online and when it is reasonable to um, end conversations and, uh, and draw some personal boundaries. Um, and so I... Uh, as I said, I have been kind of going on instinct on that, um, and I think that's uh, like to try to reinforce that instinct is a good um, way mm-hmm. to go. Uh, but I also um, think it would be helpful to have some clarity. I mean, to and and maybe just for myself, these things are always changing, so I don't think there's a kind of rule book that can be set up that we all follow. But I I do see. Um, uh, communities supporting one another and mentorship happening as people try to navigate that kind of balance. And that's certainly a conversation that um, that we have as one city candidate seeking to really be committed to deepening democracy, to be committed to community engagement, and to be committed to being, being courageous on difficult issues, that mm-hmm. figuring out um, how we protect ourselves uh, and our families in that um, and our mental health is uh, just, a, I think, an ongoing challenge to navigate. Yeah, I mean, I would add, um, 
for me, a one one struggle, I mean, social media in general, I struggle with, I think a lot of people struggle with, because it's something like, you know, that fear of missing out in many ways, because that's where a lot of people you engage with are. That's where a lot of politics that I'm involved in happen. Mm-hmm. And I like to be involved in those things. Um, prior to running, I was like, maybe I could just delete my Facebook account. And it's actually <laughs> really hard to do that. Yeah. You know, like, because I've been on Facebook, like a lot of people my age have been on Facebook for up 10 years or so and I'd like going back I'm like oh it's, there's some you know 17 year old Brandon was kind of stupid um, to admit that decisions. but you know yeah. and um, and social media was also used very differently back then whereas you had these conversations open on your wall versus now mm-hmm. we have messenger which is more private and um, and you know language changes the way you use language changes over time and there's definitely language I would not use now that I might have used then um, but I also struggle more so with things like Twitter, where there is a degree of anonymity granted to people, um, where I don't know who actually on the other end of that critiquing Twitter account is. Because um, I've noticed sometimes when I say something and then there's a bunch of comments that, that there's a couple of uh, like anonymous accounts that tend to just jump at the same time. And I'm like, have this conspiracy theory in my head that they're the same person <laughs> or maybe they're from, I, you know, like from Russia. I don't know. Like, it's like... <laughs> And how do I engage with an anonymous Twitter account versus someone I know is a real person? And do I engage with an anonymous Twitter account? And I understand that there is also sometimes safety in anonymity, especially in in my community around being able to express your politics without necessarily expressing who you are, because you might be from a small town and, you know, um, being openly queer could be a detriment to your safety. And so I understand why an anonymity exists. Um, but I, yeah, I, it's const, a constant struggle around how those things, how those tools are used. Definitely. I, I, oh, I had this experience yeah. with Car Free Day on Commercial Drive uh, last weekend where I had a, a, a renter in my neighborhood. Um, I've been uh, speaking about um, support for the proposed development at First and Clark, um, which is uh, a number of affordable rental units, affordable housing units, um, and a detox and recovery center. Um, And there's some opposition to it in my neighborhood, and I um, feel strongly in support of it. And I had a member of the neighborhood come up to me in person um, and uh, and express their frustration that I'm supporting it, and they haven't been feeling heard. Um, And uh, and we had a real, you know, an in-real-life conversation about it. And he at one point said... Um, that he was disappointed with how I've been supporting it online, but he thought it was more productive to come find me in person and have that conversation. And um, it was, uh, I really appreciated that. I mean, we didn't, we didn't find agreement on it in our, uh, in real life conversation, but we certainly had a more productive conversation about it than I think would have been possible in the sphere of Twitter. So, Mm -hmm. Um, if and when that's possible, uh, I just am, am grateful for that opportunity, particularly one-on-one in a, um, in a reasonable setting to be able to talk about these issues. Yeah, I think there must be an understandable yearning to sort of go back to the days of soapbox politics and be able to clock off this stuff. But um, both of, I mean, the both of you are running with sort of openly minority in terms of traditional Vancouver electoral politics, um, coming to the role as a woman or as a queer person of color. Do you, so people are aware of those aspects of your identity in real life as well. Do you find that there is a a steep disparity between the way that you are treated in online spaces versus in those in real life encounters? Or is this something that sort of translates into the flesh as well? I mean, I can, I would say even just the privilege of being a man has has probably saved me from a lot of what other people experience. So um, I was at a an event, uh, Rethinking the Region, which was held in this this past year in Surrey, um, and the mayor of Maple Ridge was there, and she's the first term mayor, um, and they're she's supportive of these supportive housing units uh, and homeless shelters in her her community and. She was very frank. She's like, she gave us a PowerPoint presentation of just a literal page, like screenshots of the comments she gets on social media. Yeah. And it was it was frightening and appalling. And she told the story of basically how, you know, the RCMP had to show up to where she was working because there were 
credible threats against her life and her family, and they had to go to a safe house. And, like, not one person, like, there were also uh, other mayors there, and most of them are men, and have any of them experienced that? No. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's one of those things where it's like, it is different. It is very different, and if you talk to people who are who are elected in those positions and how they're treated, even for me, thinking about behavior and how I act towards people, I try to catch myself. And I think we are a lot, a lot of us are, are complicit in it and get caught up in it. So, for instance, if you think about uh, former Premier Christy Clark, a lot of people call her Christy, whereas no, no, typically no one would call the former Premier Gordon Campbell Gordon, or you know. Even, you know, like, it's it's very rare for us to call a male politician by his first name, probably. Um, and so understanding how just the way in which we name people can affect the way in which we intend to treat them. Um, yeah, so that's, I mean, I, I would say I'm, I'm, ver- I'm privileged in many ways, and I think I... I, I go around Vancouver very conscious of uh, being visibly not white, um, looking ambiguously Asian because I'm half white, half Chinese. Um, but I, I, I live in Kitsilano, which is also one of the least lesser diverse places in Vancouver. And I, I walk around with my dog and I always like, am I, are people looking at me thinking I'm here to like buy housing or like, like <laughs> recent arrival with a bunch of money and like, even though I've lived here all my life. And so it's like I, I walk around with that kind of those weird thoughts in my head which are kind of messed up um but yeah I don't know if Christine wants to comment on that (laughs) yeah I mean I I also feel like um I'm a I'm a white lady who who you know can when I give myself a good pep talk carry myself with a with a good amount of confidence in most spaces um and uh so I think that those privileges um help me uh handle and deflect uh a lot of harassment in real life, um, but I too have heard Nicole Reed, the the mayor of Maple Ridge, who's not running again, um, talk about her experiences um, of abuse uh, and credible threats to her, as well as um, people uh, trolling and and uh, following her children, knowing who her kids are and what schools they're at, um, and as a a parent of a teenager and a toddler that makes me very nervous too. I, I, um, I wonder a lot about what choice I'm making to uh, inflict that sort of thing upon my own kids uh, in their life. So um, I wrestle with that. I do think there are all of these layers uh, to harassment online and, and certainly the type of misogyny um, that we see online uh, is, uh, is distinct and terrifying um as brandon said as well as the um the type of unveiled uh, racism uh, and homophobia that exists online so i think um i'm i'm always grateful to hear i'm grateful to hear brandon's uh, thoughts on anything and particularly on this because i think we both experience it sort of similarly and differently in um in how we move between online and offline spaces Definitely. Um, another aspect that I thought would be interesting um, to go over is, um, so Christine, on your website, um, it said that you had previously run in the AMS elections while you were a UBC student. Um, mm-hmm. Had you faced any opposition or discrimination based on your gender at that time? So I should say I was acclaimed. I was a student in what was then the Faculty of Agricultural Science um, as it became the Faculty of Land and Food Systems, um, and I uh, showed up to an AMS meeting because I'm interested in um, advocacy and activism uh, and and was active particularly in protecting the UBC farm on campus at that time, um, and there wasn't an AMS rep to, uh, from AgSci because nobody had run for the position, so I Uh, was acclaimed into it. Um, So I didn't have to go through uh, the campaign uh, at that time, um, which was uh, was lucky. But I know friends who were involved in student government at the time um, had to navigate that in how they sort of held leadership. Mostly my experience at UBC, and this was not to date myself, um, like at the beginning of Facebook, um, Things, so there was a different um, balance between online and offline activism, but um, 
the network of people that I was running with and that I was involved in uh, uh, political activism on campus with were very conscious of uh, anti-oppression issues um, and really showed up and had each other's backs in it. So uh, it wasn't, I didn't come away from that experience sort of um, uh, traumatized by by the type of abuse that I see happening online now. Um, and I think that that piece of being allies for one another um, online and offline is one of the uh, really valuable pieces of feedback that I've received from this tweet, I really uh, even more appreciate uh, the need to, when when these kinds of abusive and toxic conversations happen, even, uh, even more sort of harmless, um, uh, annoying uh, trolling that happens, um, to see other folks step in and kind of take it on and deflect it. Uh, I am appreciating the value of, as I consider all of this more frequently, and I know that systems and hashtags have been set up to sort of um, for for settler folks to respond to trolls who are trolling indigenous activists online and whatnot. That there are um, systems developing online for people to really have each other's backs, and I think that's a great um, thing that we're doing. And I uh, it makes me want to step up to that role more often, and, and grateful for those who are doing that. I see. So this situation really highlights the importance of having a supportive community around you. Yeah, I think so. Um, Online and offline. Mm -hmm. One of the uh, other good pieces of advice I have received is to um, to turn off social media by, you know, 8 or 9 p.m. I mean, or more than that, but uh, by 8 or 9 p.m. to let my uh, brain settle down a little bit before trying to sleep at night and I um, and I appreciate the kind of that kind of real life advice and the support networks that exist in real life that help um, to uh, to tune out the conversations that are happening online I'm sure that would be very helpful in general um, for like even, <laughs> even <Right>. non-politicians <laughs> yeah. as well um, did you have anything else to add Brandon I mean I think when we talk about this topic um, for me, prior to to deciding to run, it took a while for me to think about it. Like, I, I think I put on social media, like, should I run? Like, is this the thing that people think is a good idea? Um, and it was, like, one of those things where I was, like, weighing these these costs in my mind of, like, okay, mm-hmm. so my life is not my own in many ways now. Um, things that I put into the world are going to be seen very differently, despite the fact that n- nothing about me has changed. Um and then I, you know, I think about the work I currently do, and I'm like, you know, being a, a queer person, like, you grow up watching people hate you for no reason, you know? Like, you watch people debate whether you can have the right to marry or um, to be in certain spaces. And, you know, like, we're resilient enough to, to withstand that kind of anonymous hate from people who don't even want to know us as people. And so I'm like, okay, well, maybe I'm up to this challenge, too. Um, and a lot of, yeah, I think a lot of it was, was preemptive for me as trying to like coach my, myself and, and my, uh, into, in, you know, what will happen if I encounter these, these issues. And, um, most of the, the criticism so far has been on my, on my age, like I'm too young to run or, or whatnot. I'm 32. I know I look much younger, which is, you know, Asian genes. Um, but, um, yeah, we'll see. And I think, uh, it's, it's still too early to know a lot of the candidates and where they stand and so I just ask folks to just get to know us before they start making these random claims of who and who we aren't. Yeah it certainly doesn't sound on the surface like a very radical ask. Um, (laughs) No. (laughs) We'll see how that one plays out. We've uh, we've just got a few minutes left on the show for today. Um, So I mean we've been picking the both of yours brains about uh, social media and harassment and all of these kind of quite negative topics, but I'd quickly like to ask you, uh, the platform that you're running for, One City just received the endorsement from the Vancouver and District Labour Council recently. Um, mm-hmm. Would one of you like to comment on like what that means to you guys and how it will impact the way that you guys are running in the election coming up this year? Sure. I So um, we're honoured, I'm honoured to receive the VDLC endorsement. Um, I think 
uh, the labor movement for for decades, for generations, has been doing work uh, around equity and social solidarity um, and affordability. Those are key issues that its members, so the Vancouver District Labor Council is a democratic organization. It's made up of uh, elected leaders from labor unions across the city. Um, I think that's important to distinguish because sometimes unions get grouped together with uh, corporations and they're really um, very distinct uh, in their structure. Um, so the VDLC is committed to a lot of the same issues that we at One City are tackling affordability and making uh, and addressing the wealth gap and making Vancouver a place where where everyone can live, uh, particularly where people who are marginalized and vulnerable and and lower income can still belong and feel at home. And so. Um, it's great to have them as a partner um, and to be able to address these issues uh, with their members uh, and with their support to folks across the city who aren't aren't fortunate enough to be union members right now. Yeah, I think I would add um, being a first time politician, um, you know, long time politicker. Uh, for me, it's. I never belonged to a, a municipal party before. I've never donated to a municipal party before. And um, to kind of step into, to, well, I mean, rather to be welcomed into one city was um, a great experience for me. Uh, I basically met up with uh, two members of one city, RJ Aquino uh, and Kara Ng, and um, we just chatted about what was important to us. And, you know, they're like, well, you know, if you think about it, just let us know. And then kind of went from there. And I loved, for me, it was about the pe- who who is actually working behind the scenes in a political party because i know you all you know the candidates and for me that's like what i do in work is a lot about art and film and you always see the actors and the actresses and the folks who are on screen but it also matters who's actually directing who's writing who's producing um and i was just so so elated to see who is who is running you know the behind the scenes lots of women folks of color uh, lots of people my age and it was just like really nice to see that um and feel welcome and um to be able to get the endorsement of uh, vdlc has been really nice and um again as a younger person as a person of color as someone who's queer um to be kind of welcome to that family is, has been really great and to be able to push um, a progressive agenda. And I know Christine and I, uh, we, we won't have the commanding presence of a, a full, you know, a majority on council, but we, I think we have the chops to, to hold council to uh, account um, for its decisions as well. Awesome. All right. I, it is time for Democracy Watch to end for this week. So I'd just like to thank um, both Brandon and Christine so much again for, for giving us your time today. Um, if you would like to find out so much more about the upcoming municipal election, do not forget to check out the News Collective's podcast. It's called Seeking Office, um, and we're covering a lot more of the candidates and the platforms uh, in more detail there. Um, next up on CITR 101.9 FM, you can enjoy No Dead Air, which is playing for you next. Thank you for joining us, and don't forget to tune in next week for more undercovered local news coverage. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this is a rebroadcast of Democracy Watch from July 19th, 